Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today's topic are con extensions or how McLean formulated it so nicely. All concepts are con extensions. Uh, we'll see what that means actually um, on the last slide. But before I would like to explain what these con extensions really are doing by giving you kind of a blueprint example of what a con extension is. So let's just jump right into it. Um, so here comes a nice way of thinking about functors from some category to set. And maybe my category in this case is more like a discrete type of category. So this example was very enlightening for me at least. Um, and I understood why category theory plays such a huge role in more discrete sciences like computer science, for example. So let's go through this example together. Um, the link to the original exposition idea is, well, it is in the description. You can have a look. It's due to John Byers. Uh, very nice. Uh, I slightly modified the example to make it kind of nicer for my context. But basically, if you look at the link, you will see it's the same example. It's a really nice illustration of what, ca what a can extension is supposed to do. It's kind of this idea of recovering information as I have kind of this subtitle. Of course, you can't really recover information. So lost information is lost. And it's kind of the best thing you can do if your information is lost. So if you've lost your key, you should somehow apply a kind of extensions. It, it won't get you very far, obviously, um, but it's kind of the best you can do. That's the whole point. Anyway, that was just a lot of waffle. I'm, I apologize. So let's look at those uh, functors from C to Z. And remember my notation for those functors or for the category of functors is um, this bracket type notation. So functors from C to Z are really like da databases in some sense, at least if you think of those as discrete categories. So here I have a very discrete category and this is my running example. So this uh, won't change. So I have a category which basically has two vertices and an arrow between them. So the arrow will represent a functor here and the vertices will represent the databases. So the, the functor in this case is really just an association from, from left to right. And I have a very boring category, which is just the vertex. So this is a category C, this is a category D, and there will be a category E in the end. Uh, and it just, it's just a category set. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Let's just set up, um, for example, a functor from C to set could be that you associate a database to uh, people one and people two, my objects here. Um, you could think of this as just, well, it's people one and people two, right? You, you understand what people one and people two means. And you could see it here, uh, my randomly generated names. So what I did <laughs> to get those names is, obviously there's a bias, so A, B, C, D, uh, E, F, G, and so on. And then I just looked at the corresponding lists online and let, let Mathematica decide by running, uh, by just giving, Mathematica gave me a random number and then just to pick the corresponding name on that list. Um, that's just what I did. Not quite, of course, Adam and Eve. Uh, those two were, were pre chosen, but all the others are kind of random names. Anyway, this was again Waffle. So, um, so the category here is very simple and it just associate people one and people two to the object of this category. And then there's this one arrow, which is then the functor and it's kind of an association. You could think of it like, um, let's say you're, you're programming a dating software and this is kind of the dating functor, if you want, right? So kind of makes makes a lot of sense. Um, D, on the other hand, so D is this slightly boring looking category. Uh, well, a functor from D to Z is really just uh, just a collection of names. That's that's what it is. Okay, fine. And I also have my embedding functor from D to C. So D obviously embeds nicely into C by just send by just sending people to people, and I call this functor G. And the co composition with G is really, really a simple functor. And it just forgets everything about what you just programmed. It just forgets everything and you just recover um, the people here, okay? So right. So the, the composition with G functor kind of is very destructive. It, it is losing your key functor. It loses just everything. And that's of course easy. Forgetting is always easy. Recovering information or remembering what you have lost or whatever, or finding it again, that's really, really hard. And this is kind of where the con extensions now come into the game. So here are databases. And now let's talk about con extensions. Um, left and right. So first left, the left con extension. 
So the left can't, so left is always like free. It's very generous. We'll see what that means. And right is kind of the converse. It's very conservative. We'll see what that means in this example. Uh, just recall here, this is the same setup as on the, on the last slide. Okay, so um, a factor from D to Z, as I said, is nothing else than something very boring. And you kind of want to recover um, the information that is lost. And the Khan extension, in this case, the left Khan extension, is usually denoted by L, A, N, lower G, and then F. So it's a left Khan extension of this functor F, where we want to recover. The functor F is just the functor that's lost all information, and we want to cover it along the functor G. Okay, so that's what we want to do. And the left Khan extension should do that. And well, you've lost all the dating information. So it's kind of a dating factor in this case, right? It's a factor from C to Z. But you, you only know this set. It's kind of built into the setup because you know the factor F. And well, that's kind of your pre-chosen database. But you have no clue what to put on the other side. So I have no idea. And there are two ways to basically now recover the information, the left way and the right way, if you want. And the left way is, well, you give every, every person here just a, a symbol and you just number them one, two, three, four, whatever. So you, and every dating here, so everyone gets its own its own mate. So everyone gets its own mate and they're all different, right? You're very generous. Everyone gets something different. Just number them by variables if you want. I could have also called that X, Y, Z, whatever. And then you're good to go. And that's the left cut extension factor in this case. So the left cut extension recovers data very generously. It's just everything, just everything gets its own. It's a free version of doing things. And with contrast, the, well, same setup as I said, the right functor is more like the conservative factor. It's really the same setup. Now I have the right kind extensions, usually denoted by R and G, uh, R -A -N, well, lower G and then F, really the same setup. And there's another way of recovering, kind of recovering in huge quotation marks, of course, uh, information. Namely, you just give, you just, there's just one person and you just associate everything to one person. It's a very conservative way of doing it. And kind of the, the breadth, these are really two extremes. Left, very generous, everyone gets its, its own. Right, very conservative, everyone just gets, but there's just one, right? And everything just mapped to one. And of course, <laughs> recovering information has to come with a cost here, right? We, we kind of have lost almost everything. And it's kind of the best, the best we can do. And left and right, they're just kind of different approaches to this problem. One is very generous and one is very conservative. And it's kind of the same idea for adjoins and adjoins. So left adjoint is, is a free, usually the very generous one. The right adjoint is a very conservative one. I remember this example of topology, topological spaces, the forgetful functor to set had two adjoints, a left and a right one. Either everything is open or kind of only the minimal things that are open are open. So the discrete or uh, the indiscrete or the discrete um, topology on the set. And it's really the same setup for Khan extensions. And Khan extensions are really in the end, just a more fancy version of adjoints um, or a more general version of adjoints. I will come back to that in a second. But let's now see how this fits into a, a general framework. So here's the definition of a Khan extension, left and right, obviously. We only need to read the left one if you understand the left one and the, kind of the right one is kind of the dual as usual. Um, so let's have a look. So basically it's defined by this universal diagram. So what do you have? Well, you have this functor F from D to E. And remember in my example, E was the category of sets, right? So this is just set in my example. And well, D and G are D and G in my example. Anyway, and you have this functor F um, from D to E. And you also have this functor G that goes to C. Right, these were my two factors here on the last slide. So I had a factor F or on, on all these slides, I had a factor F and I had a factor G here. Okay, and you kind of want to fill in this diagram. This is my recovering information. You're kind of looking for this funny factor here. And yeah, and that's the factor you would like to have. It's just the, the recover information factor and it's denoted by L and G and it's defined by universal property in the usual sense. So if you have another one, then they exist a the unique, whatever. Let's forget that for a second. Um, so the, this factor that fills in this diagram, but not 
in the way you think it would fill in the diagram. It's not like the functor is such that the composition here, so um, this is the composition, right, is equal to f. It's not commutative because you've lost the information. This comes with the cost. You can't assume that it is commutative, but rather you have this funny natural transformation here um, that goes from f, so it goes here from f to uh, those this is a composition. So they're not equal. There's only a natural transformation between them. That's kind of the, the minimal condition you would like to have. So they're not unrelated, right? That's the whole point. They're not completely unrelated, but certainly it's not an equality or anything. It's quite far away because, as I said, we have lost information. That's the whole point. And the right kind of extension is really just the same thing, just reversed. And everything is defined up to, well, you know, it's a usual unique property. If there's another functor like this, then there exists a unique tra natural transformation between them and so on and so on. And because they're defined by these universal properties, keep in mind that the universal property means they might not exist, but if they exist, they're unique up to unique isomorphism. So basically what this is saying is that there are two unique ways to recover information and both of them are pretty stupid actually. <laughs> uh, so that's just what it is. So if you ever lose information, sorry, uh, kind of sense won't really help. <laughs> but anyway, it's a really nice way of thinking about it, I think, right? You need to recover the information the best you can do. There are two ways of doing it basically. Let's, let's take the left one. You just associate a person to, to every lost information point. And this is, of course, not what you started with. So you can't really assume you have something nice here. And kind of the minimal thing you have is this natural transformation here in my uh, red box. OK, kind of makes sense, I hope. Um, and well, the point is, I started this video with can extensions everywhere, or can extensions, all concepts are can extensions. This is this very famous, uh, well, I don't want to call it a quote. Actually, a section title or subsection, whatever it is, in MacLean's book is called All Concepts Are Can Extensions. And all is, <laughs> of course, meant in huge quotation marks, whatever all means. Um, in this case, limits and adjoints are can extensions. In a very funny way, actually, kind of look at the diagram. Okay, here's the two diagrams. So let, let's focus on this one. The other one is kind of messed up a little bit. So let's look at the diagram. And well, you have lots of input you can put here. You can vary D, C, E, F, G, whatever. Um, and kind of limits and co-limits arise for trivial choices of those inputs. So let's have a look at the precise statement. Maybe let's have a look at the adjoints. They're a little bit nicer. Um, so if you are looking for a left adjoint of a factor G, from D to C, or a right adjoint, doesn't really matter. D from D to C, this is this one here. So the right can extension will do the job. The only thing you need to do is you need to specialize this one here to the identity on D. In this case, of course, if this is identity on D, then this just becomes D. So you have a D to D functor. So it goes D to C to D and the run, uh, the right can extension in this case is the left adjoint. Okay, so it's pretty cool, right? You specialize the diagram to something trivial. In this case, the identity factor here on uh, on C. I should have put not identity factor in quotation marks. I was supposed to put trivial in quotation marks. Anyway, uh, hope you forgive me. Anyway, um, the, the slightly confusing point here is somehow the notation is messed up. So the right kind extensions is the left adjoint, and the left kind extensions is the right adjoint. It's just what it is. Um, and in the end, well. Um, this is how it works, right? So you, you, the, identity, the point here is you, you plot in the identity functor on, on D. Yeah. Okay. So then that's the corresponding left, respectively, right adjoint. And the limits arise very similar. So in this case, you take C to be a very boring category, my point category. So this is just C. And if this is a point category, then the limit arises using um, the left or right limit or co limit. Uh, can extension and you evaluate it as on the unique object and that's your limit. It's a pretty cool way of doing it, right? So the classical concepts, classical, now I got my quotation marks correct, the classical concepts in category theory are kind of trivial cases of can extensions and that's why this quote here originated, uh, in, so, so this quote, whatever, this uh, section title in MacLean is actually uh, quite precise, uh, despite the fact that all is uh, maybe a little bit of an overstatement. Anyway, so let me wrap up. 
So I think this example, I actually do like it. So this example of can extensions and recovering informations. And of course, this comes with the cost. So the can extension, keep that in mind, has this additional input of this natural transformation instead of an equality. But basically what it is, it fills in the corresponding triangle diagram, if it exists, of course. And then you're good to go. And you have a left version and a right version and evaluating it on kind of the trivial inputs and now I did my quotation marks again, correct? Trivial inputs um, gives you limits, co-limits, adjoints, left and right. And this is actually pretty nice. So kind of extensions are a pretty powerful tool in category theory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.